All right. Lucy D'Agostino McGowan, welcome to Not So Standard Deviations. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Are you really, though? Are you? I am. I am. I don't know if it's like a high bar because I'm excited by a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> That's the part you're not supposed to tell me, you know, at least not. Yeah, Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm really excited. I'm a huge fan of Not So Standard Deviations. I am very excited to have you on here. I can't tell you how special an occasion this is. Oh, it's great. I've been listening for <laughs> several, several years. Yeah, like definitely, definitely since like the beginning of when I was sort of starting to do work in grad school. So followed my career really well and we don't have we don't often have you know guest co-hosts on the show so this is like a, a rare occurrence for us but um we decided to do this because hillary is as most listeners at this point know working on the biden campaign and um it's like <laughs> kind of a busy week yeah <laughs> <laughs> so we figured we just uh block this one off and uh and we're having you on now well, it's very exciting. It's exciting on all fronts, hopefully, <laughs> yeah. for Hillary's part. I hope that that's exciting. I was, maybe, can you briefly just uh, say who you are, what you do, and why you're important? Yeah, I don't know about the last part, but I can definitely say uh, who I am and what I do. I So my name is Lucy D'Agostino McGowan. I am currently an assistant professor in the math and stats department at Wake Forest University, which is in North Carolina. And uh, my work, I do work on... Um, a couple different areas. Data science kind of pedagogy is one area that I, I was a postdoc at Hopkins with Jeff Leak and worked with him on a lot of that kind of work along with human data interaction stuff. But then I also do work in causal inference and I have a podcast too uh, that I, I do with Ellie Murray that's called Casual Inference. Um, and so I guess those are a couple things about me. Are there other things that I should mention, Roger? Um, not that I can think of. I do. I really like your podcast. I think it's great. Um, thank you. And I, I think you and Ellie are doing a great job. And I was really jealous that like you guys, you both figured it out. <laughs> it took took me like five years to get to this place and you figured, figured it out pretty quickly. So, well, this is, yeah, see, we benefited from all of your experience. <laughs> I've been like pinging you for <laughs> advice since the beginning from like, what microphones should we get? Right. <laughs> what software should we use? And so you basically got to figure it all out the hard way. And then we just got to hear your answers to all your questions. <laughs> well, that's, that's the way it should be, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's been fun though. But you have like buzzers and music and it's really just next level. So Yeah. Yeah. I like our music. Our buzzer, I think I'm indifferent to at this point, but <laughs> we do have a buzzer. The buzzer's in transition right now. Yeah, buzzer is in a transition. That's right. It's having a hard time. The buzzer we use typically to try to keep things casual. So if people are using too much jargon, but unfortunately, I am in full control of the buzzer and also one of the more likely people to use jargon. So. It's a conflict of interest is what that is. It is a little bit. It is. I thought of myself as someone that doesn't use a lot of jargon, but unfortunately statistics, like epidemiology definitely has jargon, but the epidemiologists that we've had have been pretty good about not using it. But statistics is like just riddled with jargon, but it turns out sounds casual if you're talking about all the time, but sounds really jargony to basically anybody else. So... Actually, that reminds me of a story. I remember when I first came to Hopkins, like, I didn't know anything about epidemiology. And so I had to you know, learn it. And uh, I remember someone told me that um, epidemiologists have so many different words for describing the relationship between X and Y in the presence of Z. <laughs> I, was, I just think it's true. I mean, that, that's, I mean, that's jargon, I guess. They have a lot of jargon for that one thing. It's totally true. Although statisticians then have different words. And like, if you talk to maybe someone like a bioinformaticist or maybe someone who's doing like genetic statistics, then like they'll have different words. So yeah. it's like, it's like, I, yeah, the epidemiologists definitely have a lot of different words for things, but then we all, for some reason, it all came from like, I think it has to do with what field your discipline grew out of, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. And data scientists too. The one hot encoding is the one that I think always comes up for like when you think about. Oh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't that, that's when you take like a factor and expand it out into like an indicator matrix? Yeah. Yeah. An indicator variable. Yeah. Or, or dummy variable is another word for it, but they're all like, <laughs> why? <laughs> why are these all the words for it? That's one that I think that we're the most correct by calling it an indicator variable because that sounds the least jargony to me, but I suppose that's. I don't because it's not though, really. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> but it like indicates, yeah, you're, you know, I mean, you're right. But dummy variable, like, why would it be dummy? And like one hot encoding, I don't even understand where that comes from. Where does the hot, I get where the encoding comes from, but where does the hot come from? I don't know. I don't know. It's like there's this imputation methods called hot deck imputation, I think is what it called. Hot deck imputation. Yeah. Like, where does, what makes it hot? I don't understand. I don't know. Yeah, we should, maybe some of your listeners know, this, this can be like a, <laughs> listeners can write in and tell us where, <laughs> where the word, why is it hot? Yes, please do. NSSDeviations at gmail.com. We don't say that often enough, but. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right. Well, first, you know, we have to, I'm a stickler for format, as you know. Yes. And so uh, we have to start with some follow-up. And the first bit of follow-up comes from uh, Lucy D'Agostino McGowan. Do you know her? <laughs> yeah, I've met her before. <laughs> I, the, is it the cats follow-up? She says, I like cats, the musical. I'm allergic to the animal. Yes. I just thought you could use another data point on that because I enjoyed the conversation in the last episode about uh, Hillary seems to really, she's not seen the musical, but she did not like the movie. And there was speculation on some different kind of what would make people like the musical or not like the musical or like the movie and not like the movie. And I thought I'd add a data point that I do like the musical. I have not seen the movie. I don't own a cat and I've never owned a cat. I'm allergic, allergic to cats. I did watch the musical as a child. I think that was another piece of information that you had discussed because you would, you had watched it as a child. Yes. Um, but when you were a child and when I was a child were different times. <laughs> um, That's and, true. And so but gra granted, there may be like a ch a common like childhood element there. Yeah, because I think Hillary was trying to argue that like you, you were nostalgic or something or you didn't right. know you didn't know better. <laughs> you didn't know better not to like it. I think she may have called me an idiot at some point. But no. <laughs> that, that might have been off the show, not on the air. Well, but I no, I. Um, so I did, I did see it as a child in theaters and I did enjoy it and I still enjoy it. I like the music. I don't like memories. I can't remember actually. Was that, did she say that was, she liked it and you didn't, or was it the opposite? She didn't like it. Yeah. She liked it and I did not. Yeah. Okay. I also don't like that song, but I wonder, see, I, and I was trying to think about this. I wonder if that's because I saw it as it, like that song's kind of like sad <laughs> well it's the only song in the musical that really has any like emotion to it um, yeah and so i think so that's the one song that t.s Eliot didn't write um and so oh, interesting and so i think i can't remember who wrote the lyrics but it was just written you know at the time and um so but i think the thinking at the time was that without that song there's no real like emotional arc to this like i mean there's barely a story at all even with that song but yeah. without the song, there's no like emotional arc at all. And there's no like main character really. So, yeah. So maybe that's why, I mean, I think, cause I was not like super invested in the actual storyline. I just thought the music was fun and like, that's kind of how I felt too. But I think maybe expectations are different now. <laughs> it's like people are expecting a story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, also when it's a film, I mean, I, I don't know. I haven't seen the movie, but I think that there's like a different, like going to a theater, it, like you could go to a, a th you know, you go to like a symphony and you don't necessarily expect to like get a story. You just like enjoy the music that's coming from the stage. And I feel like going to musical theater, I mean, there often is a story it's somewhat, but you can enjoy, you can get a good experience from just like having fun music that you listen to that sort of follows a general theme with dancing. You know, I think like yeah. it's possible to Whereas if you're watching a film, it's like a little bit harder to probably get into it if it's just like there's no <laughs> line between them or there's like a forced line that doesn't make sense or something. Yeah, I think in the theater, people are much more accepting of things that would normally be like absurd. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. Well, anyways, I just thought I would I would offer an additional data point on this. So I think uh, I think I don't think we're in the minority. I know Hillary seemed to think we're in the minority for liking cats. I don't think that's true. I mean, I think a lot. I don't think that is true either. But let me just say that, like, so she and I kind of followed up after we recorded that episode, and I think it's good that she's not on this episode right now. Uh, <laughs> Because, she can't defend her position. <laughs> well, no, because A, because you represent like the worst case scenario where you like the musical and you don't even like the animals. Like at least I like the animals too, right? Yeah, it's not. I definitely like don't have a bunch of a appeal to uh, cats are not appealing to me. And so I don't think that it's not. I mean, I never it wouldn't have occurred to me. Like, I think you guys are both saying last time that 
the cats actually do things that cats do. And like that, I don't think even like as an adult, that didn't occur to me because I don't really know what cats do. Right. It didn't occur to me either at the, yeah, at the time, cause I didn't own any cats, but yeah, it's kind of interesting now, but yeah. um, let me just say that um, there, there is this amazing kind of like one hour S video essay on YouTube about cats, both the movie and the musicals by Lindsay Ellis. Um, I'll put the link in the show notes. It's pretty amazing, actually. Oh, well, I'll have to watch it. Yeah. That's awesome. I'll have to find it. But yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, all right, moving on. We have another piece of follow-up. Um, this was regarding the conversation I had with Hillary last episode about kind of um, figuring out like how to explain like when things go wrong. I think we had that discussion. Maybe you remember better than I do. But, <laughs> but like when like data analysis kind of fail in some sense. Yeah. Um, and Stefan wrote in about there's a particular kind of uh, kind of process approach called failure modes and effects analysis or FMEA sometimes referred to. And um, and the idea there is that like, you know, you kind of build a system like like imagine like a car or an airplane or something like that. And the system is made up of multiple parts and multiple subsystems. And and the idea is like you, you try to think about you know, what, what happens if this one little subsystem fails, you know, how could that percolate through the the overall system and cause like potential catastrophic events basically. Um, so it's kind of like a, that it's, so that kind of analysis kind of helps you to understand how different parts of the system are connected and kind of what, how they might cause events to occur. So anyway, it was a nice email. I appreciate it. Yeah, that's awesome. I, this is like, it's so funny because so Roger, you shared this uh, list of things we might talk about and you had this sort of line that, you know, Stefan wrote about failure modes and effect analysis. And so I did some, <laughs> I did some research. So I was like, oh, I wonder what that's in reference to. And so I Googled, literally I Googled Stefan wrote in about failure <laughs> modes and effect analysis, that exact line. And this paper popped up that was just published. It came out in August. So I was like, oh, that must be what he's talking about. And the first author's name is Stefan, although I think it's a different Stefan maybe than the one that wrote in. It's not the one that wrote in, yeah. Yeah, and it's on failure modes and effect analysis to develop transfer protocols for managing COVID-19 patients. And so I thought that's what this was in reference to. And I was so excited that I was like, had found it and I read the paper and I like knew something about it. <laughs> you, you prepared for something that like was never going to happen. Exactly. But it is something that seems to be being used and it seems really useful. I mean, I, in the paper they talk about, it was a group of anesthesiologists that were having to move um, patients. Like basically the expectation was that the, if their hospital got overloaded, they'd have to be quickly moving patients that have this infectious disease diagnosis. And so they made this, these like checklists of all the different steps they'd have to do to be able to move a patient. And then they found like where the failure points would be and they practiced it and stuff anyways that does sound cool actually <laughs> yeah it was it was pretty cool they and it was cool to see because they like I, i'm sure this is probably how it is too in like what the actual stuff I wrote about for air airplanes and stuff but they run these like simulations so they do it like with you know with people who would actually be doing it to try to like actively find where the sticking points are. And then they amend this, like an iterative process of amending the checklists to try to like adjust for those sticking points. And it feels like very practical and smart to do kind of in advance of actually having a crisis. Yeah. Yeah. Usually often it's done after the crisis, <laughs> yeah, occurs, I know. but it's better to do it before. Yeah. Yeah. It was impressive that they, this hospital was thinking about that because I think yeah, it's much easier to, in retrospect, be like, oh, that didn't work. Maybe we should figure out what the sticking point was. And then you never have that problem again. So it didn't matter that you figured out the sticking point. Well, um, you know, it's funny. I think I think it's funny that we're talking about this paper because, like, <laughs> it had nothing to do with the actual... Because <laughs> it's not at all what... But it is, on, it is on topic for the podcast, though, which is about... Which I think we often talk about how there are systems that, uh, that kind of their data analysis something because can be thought of as a system and um but often we when things go wrong we focus on like blaming people who are responsible and but we don't focus on like changing the system to prevent failure from occurring again so um which are separate things i would say no i think that's exactly right. and the, even just the idea of like checklists for data analyses and stuff i mean i think it's something that i know you and i have talked about in other contexts too but it is relevant to sort of think about, you know, you could probably think about certain checklists for things that would catch certain common failure points. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, actually, don't uh, hold that thought. We're coming back to it in this episode. Okay. Yeah. Because I have something very special for you in store. We're gonna do something oh, that we so we're doing something that we've never done before on this podcast. We're, I'm trying to. I'm gonna. I'm interested in creating a new segment. Um, Ooh. I'll get to it, but we'll get to it later. I love segments. <laughs> I really do. So before that, though, we have to do a little follow out. So do you know what? Have you heard? Do you know what follow out is? I actually don't. I saw you listed it, and actually, like mentally, I thought it should go at the end because I was thinking it was like I don't know. It's, following out of the episode but it sounds like that's not what it means no so follow out is a follow up on a podcast that's not this podcast <laughs> oh, okay. so i want to follow out on your podcast okay um, because you talked about well in, in the last episode of casual inference you talked about uh this paper by emily oster who's an economist and she was talking about she wrote an article in the atlantic about schools uh, opening schools and kind of covid cases and things like that i don't want to get into it too much um but i did think i wanted to get your thoughts on kind of the challenges of doing scientific communications and so one of the things that kind of intrigued me about your discussion with her was that there was no like traditional research paper that it was like an article written in the atlantic which is like a you know what would you call it, the atlantic it, I used i would used to call it a magazine but i don't know what it is now so um but it's like a popular yeah it was definitely an opinion piece too. So it was like, yeah. But designed for like a mass audience, right? Not just like a right. specialized audience. Yeah. And I guess one of the things I've been thinking about this a little bit, just because like there's an element of writing about science that is, you know, that conflicts in the sense that like you have to, in order to write a good story, I think you have to have very clear, I would say like causal links in, in the elements of your story. Um, because otherwise it kind of the story kind of doesn't make sense i think um but i think like scientists in general are or good scientists i just are reluctant to do that um and i think there's like a careful balance between you know what or maybe there's a careful decision to be made about when do we when do we go out there and say okay here's a that causes b that causes c and therefore we have to do that right like that's like a story that people want to read i think um as opposed to like here we did the study here's the evidence you know you figure it out I think that that's right. But I think that the, that there's an element of like, um, I, especially in a like popular piece, there's a difference between describing, like describing a descriptive analysis that's not making causal claims, but then as an expert giving kind of your opinion on it, but, but explicitly stating that like, this is what you would do, or this is the decision that you would make, but separating that from the evidence that's being presented. You know what I mean? Like, I think, I think it's still possible to write a piece. I don't know. I, I go kind of around on this, but I think it's possible to write a piece that tells a story, but appropriately sort of like articulates the uncertainty in this story. So you can still talk about kind of the causal quantities that you're hoping to be able to talk about or the causal links, but like giving accurate uh, description of kind of the actual uncertainty and how like the kind of causal link is something that you're drawing as a, like, like you're drawing it as an individual, you're drawing that conclusion, not that the data necessarily gives you that information. I guess, yeah, I, I think I go back and forth on like how well those two jobs can be done by the same person, I guess, in the same piece for that matter. You know, I, you know, I think I do support the idea that like scientists should be out there and like, you know, uh, presenting their work and kind of engaging with the public, right? Um, but I almost feel like, I mean, there, I don't know. I just feel like it can be, in, ex in the extreme, I think it can it can kind of erode trust if like you have the scientists selling the science, you know, to people. Right. No, yeah, I agree. I don't know. It's, uh, it's just something I've been thinking about. It's just because I feel like it's so much easier to communicate now, you know, to get people, to get pieces on the web or whatever. And, um, I wonder if they're, I guess I'm just kind of wondering if there's any limits to that, really. Well, and I think the other piece, too, is that, like, what, so I actually, shortly after that that piece came out, um, there was a piece in the New York Times that I felt like actually, like, did a lot of what, you know, I, I had gone back and forth on, like, well, is it even possible to write a piece that would, like, check all the boxes that I personally would want checked for sort of communicating something that gives the proper amount of uncertainty, but still sort of tells people that like a decision has to be made and this is the decision I'm recommending, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, that that's not going to change at a, at a different time. And after talking to Emily, I was like, not sure if it was possible to do something like that in sort of like a, 
um, a piece that would be appealing to a wide audience. But then this this article came out, um, Apurva Mendevili, she's been writing a lot of COVID stuff for New York Times. And she did this piece that w- the title of her piece was School Children Seem Unlikely to Fuel Coronavirus Surges, Scientists Say which is a very different title than um, schools are not super spreader events. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, and I, and then, so the title itself was even, I, I like, but then the other thing that she like, you know, the way that she framed it was she sort of explicitly stated the uncertainty, but then she did give kind of what experts were saying. And then she also was able to sort of anchor the claim in like a point of time. So like, this is what we're seeing to date. Um, but giving kind of the appropriate sense that, you know, this is still an ongoing data collection effort and this, the, the experts might change their mind if they start seeing something different. And so like the exact line, I pulled it out. She said, the evidence is far from conclusive and much of the research has been tarnished by flaws, but still many experts are encouraged by the results to date. And then she's got those experts quoted in the article. And so I wonder, I mean, maybe that gets at kind of what you were saying that maybe the scientists maybe it's hard for the scientists to be the ones to write the full, like maybe you do need to have some like third party compiling the information, but then you can still have experts weigh in on kind of what they think the decision should be. Because I can, I can hear Emily's point that like, we can't just say this is the data and that's all we're going to tell you. We're not going to help you interpret it because you know, it's too hard to interpret and there's too much uncertainty because decisions, not making a decision is the equivalent to making a different decision, you know, especially when you're thinking about something like schools opening, where if you don't decide to open schools, you're effectively deciding not to open schools. Right. I One challenge, though, I, her situation in many ways, well, in one way was unique, which is that like, there was not like there's all these other studies out there, right? Like, she gathered the data because precisely because I'm talking about so Emily Oster, like she gathered the data because there wasn't any, right? Um, and so in, it's not like, so I think her situation was unique, because like, it's her data and like who and like she could either sit around and wait for someone to write about it or just write about it right it wasn't like there was a lot of studies to gather from and try to like and try to synthesize right um but i guess yeah so i think the issue for me is kind of like how much how do we think about someone who does the the research or collects the data and then goes on to write about it um because i do feel like there is like a mild there's like an inherent mild conflict there um and so if you are the one telling the story, I mean, yeah, this is kind of like the direct to consumer version of for science, right? You know, in the business world, there's like all this is happening too, where like companies go direct to consumer and they don't bother going through some intermediary, right? Um, like a supermarket or something. But it's um, and so it's possible to do. But I think I think I don't. I, I'm not. I feel like I'm not the only one discussing this. But just it struck me when you had your conversation with Emily Oster about kind of how far could it go? I guess. Yeah. And it's also challenging because I think that, I mean, you, I think you brought this up too, but the, the potential for kind of the public to lose trust and, you know, sci- like quote unquote scientists in general, we are like everybody doing any kind of research, especially related to COVID related things kind of get lumped into this like single category of scientists. And, and anytime one makes a strong recommendation and then the recommendation ends up changing, there's like a little bit of trust eroded, I think, when um, when the initial recommendation maybe isn't given with the correct level of uncertainty. So there's this like challenge of like, is there some obligation to like the field broadly of science to be more careful because, you know, you got you have to like sort of uphold public trust and what, how that plays in, I think is challenging. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I just think that, I mean, when I was raised, so to speak, <laughs> as a scientist, you know, yeah. the, my mentors and the people that I worked with, they they made it clear under no, wait, I got to get this phrase right, under no uncertain, wait, <laughs> under no in uncertain, no uncertain in no uncertain terms, <laughs> <laughs> wow, they made it very clear to me that that I do not make recommendations about policy, period. There's no exceptions to that rule. rule. Um, and so as a sign, and they, I, mean, I was taught basically as a scientist, it's not your job to make recommendations about policy. And, and that's yeah. pretty relevant in the environmental, you know, area where there's all kinds of regulations and stuff like that. And, you know, you didn't, and, you know, 
I was told you don't go out there and say we need to lower the standard or we need to raise the standard or whatever. Like that's not what you say. Um, and so I think maybe I'm just biased in because that's kind of how I grew up. And um, and also that was a time that where the internet was a very different place. And so I think um, I, I just I, I, in some sense like you know the intermediaries like reporters or whatnot they can kind of filter the story in bad ways. But I think on the other hand they can protect scientists in some ways too. Uh, in terms of, like you said, their credibility. Yeah, well, it's interesting you say that too, because I actually have the same, I mean, I I recall very clearly my training, especially Frank Carroll has a lot um, to say in some of his kind of regression modeling strategies classes and things about how as statisticians, or at least how I internalized, I, I don't want to put words, <laughs> but how I internalized what he had sort of taught us was that as statisticians, our role is typically to like, you know, fit the model and tell the person the probability, but you're not supposed to be kind of determining decision, decision thresholds and things like that. And which I think kind of plays into what you're saying about making policy decisions. Like you just tell them what the evidence, like what the model says. And then, you know, in our case, because a lot of times the application that I was working in was uh, like a medical application, the doctors would be the ones then deciding, you know, if I have a risk prediction model and we predict that somebody is going to um, like, I don't know. The the one that I remember was if you're going to vomit after getting anesthesia. So if we predict that you have, you know, a, a 60% chance of vomiting after anesthesia, kind of do we have, does the doctor do something different or not? And that decision is one that the, like someone on the medical side would be making. And we would just be saying that the probability is 60%. You know, we, we don't like make the determination of at what point do you need to do something about it. We just tell you that this patient based on their characteristics has this probability of having some event happen. And then the decision thresholds are determined by kind of more content matter experts. But I wonder if like some of that is because we are trained to be focusing on the statistical part because somebody has to make the policy decision. Right. Yes. And I, I, that's what I've been told too. you know, like that's like kind of a very traditional statistical kind of education as at least as part of one, at least. And I think uh, the only thing that's different for me is that I feel like if you're part of a team that is doing this research, then I'm happy to be involved in that discussion. You know, and I like I I'm I'm not someone who just like passes off the evidence and then says, oh, it's up to you. You know, you're that's your problem. <laughs> good <right>? luck. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm happy to be part of that discussion. And especially if I have a good relationship with those people, you know, like. I'm happy to be right there in there trying to figure out, well, what should the rule be? Um, but I think, but that's kind of like we're all in the family here. You know, it's like it's all, we're all doing research together. And I think it's different if you like go out in public and say the EPA needs to like lower the standard for particulate matter. Like that's not, that's a oh, different right. kind of thing where it's like, yeah, that in that case, like we're not all in the family. Like you know, that, that that's a government agency. They have their own thing going on. And like, so then I think there's a much more clear kind of dividing line. Well, I'm interested in, I mean, not to like, but I'm also interested in the conversations with the government agencies that are making those decisions, because I actually think that even I was in a conversation last week with a couple of folks that were, um, you know, involved with some early decisions about different kind of communications that went out about things pandemic related. And, um, and, you know, there, we were talking about is there's an element of we, we need the public to do the thing we're recommending. And so the impression was that uh, kind of an overemphasis or an emphasis at all on the uncertainty um, will lower like public kind of adherence to whatever the recommendation is because they'll think like, oh, we're not that certain. Like the agency that's recommending this is actually not that certain. Right. But then, you know, I had sort of brought up that that's true in the short term, but in the long term, if you, of course, then go and have to reverse your recommendation, you know, maybe having more explicit uh, uncertainty communicated would sort of make it more likely that in the future that they would sort of with it, that they would uh, adhere to the recommendations or at least would like sort would continue to build up trust in the institution. And so it's sort of this like trade off. Uh, and also you're kind of hedging because, you know, you don't know, I guess you hope that your first guess based on whatever limited data you have is correct. And so you don't know that in the future, you're gonna have to reverse your recommendation. But well, uh, this we could probably spend the whole episode on this topic, but we have <laughs> more important things to get to. <laughs> I appreciate your thoughts on it, though. No, I I love talking about this stuff. I think it's really, um, I think it's really important because, especially now, it's like crucial that people are sort of feel like they're getting the information necessary. So yeah, it's not there. Not a lot of clear answers, in my opinion. 
All right. We have three important topics for this yes. episode with you. And, I'm, and the very first one is probably maybe the most important, which is what computer <laughs> should Lucy get? Yes. I'm so excited. So you let me pick some topics and I was like, oh, I selfishly like have some startup funding and you seem like I'm going to have like a cop- captive audience of you <laughs> for some time. So I'm going to see if I can get you to tell me what computer I should get, because I feel like you're kind of you're like a tech guru and you know these things. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, as I thought about your question last night, uh, I realized that like I don't think this is a question that people ask themselves very often. Actually, it's kind of interesting. I feel like because I think if you go to like work for some job somewhere, most of the time they'll just give you a computer. <laughs> I feel like yeah, you just get what you get. Like yeah, like maybe you could choose Mac or Windows or something like that. Um, but like you'll probably get some laptop and like and maybe configure it a little bit and that's it right like so i feel like i I wonder like how many people get to ask this question if it's not like you know on a personal level like if you're just buying your own computer that's one thing but for work um i feel like most people probably don't get this kind of choice so this is kind of nice it's actually kind of nice that like we can think about like what to get yeah well and i i feel like it can it can bring up, it can dig up some old not so standard deviations conversations too, because I, so when I wrote in for my startup, I like requested, you know, a budget for computing in general. And I wrote in sort of the like flexibility that I might purchase one that I could basically run kind of everything that I would need to on my like physical computer. But then I also kind of wrote in, or maybe I would pay for some, you know, AWS time or something. <laughs> and so I can pull up that, because I feel like you've had conversations about like, should you just get a really high powered desktop computer or should you rely more on cloud computing? And so this can also play into this conversation. That's true. We have, yeah, Hillary's always been on the cloud computing side of things. Yeah. yeah I think that's how she works, even, you know, for her work, work. <laughs> That was an awkwardly phrased. Uh, um, and so I think she works off a laptop. Um, and as do I. My, I have, my, my feeling is that I never want to buy a desktop computer ever again, I think. Even though I don't do a lot of cloud computing. But that's just, I think that's just me. Uh, no, that's, I mean, I don't currently, I so my current computer that I'm using like to do this uh, podcast on right now, is the, it's a computer I got in my postdoc, which... Was, it's only, I did my postdoc, I started my faculty job a year ago, so I, my postdoc was a year before that. So it's only two years old. It's not like an old laptop, but um, I do like all, most of my work on that and it's been mostly fine, but um, but I'm also trying to figure out because I'm going to be on research leave uh, in the fall. And so I sort of will have like a good chunk of time to work on stuff that I hadn't had time to work on before. So maybe I would want to have like the whatever kind of fancy computing all set up before that well you know the the pandemic kind of threw a wrench in like all of my thinking <laughs> to the point where yeah. like i thought about getting a desktop because <laughs> you're home all the time i'm not well it, it, the, the mobility the portable aspect of the laptop's not really playing a big you know role in my life right now yeah um because i like i'm the kind of i like i just carry the computer back and forth like there's so, there's other people who like they don't want to carry anything so they have a computer at work and they have a computer at home and it's like you know they don't want to carry anything. Well, the other thing that, and maybe see, I don't know enough about this to like fully know, know even if this is the right kind of question, but if you had like a desktop in your office, like, couldn't you like remote in, I mean, couldn't you just like remote into that with your laptop from home? So it's sort of like, you don't have to worry about an actual cloud, but you're treating your desktop as a cloud. You could do that. Yeah. I, I've never, I've never done that. Even when I had like office desktops but um you could do that and some people i think do it well um but now with like server like cloud computing like it's i think it's somewhat less necessary but um so my issue with like i struggled with laptops for like a couple years because most laptops like the maximum amount of ram you could get was like 16 gigabytes i think uh, for like smaller laptops um and so now that ram ceiling has gotten quite a bit higher um, and it's just for things like R and R studio, like you do need quite a bit of Ram a lot of times. Um, and so I, uh, also the thing is like throughout my career, I feel like I've, sw- I've swung like massively back and forth between getting like some tiny little netbook type thing to some huge laptop type thing. <laughs> and so I, I, there's not a lot of consistency. I think it depends a little bit on kind of like what phase of my life I'm in right now. So right now I'm in the massive laptop phase. Okay. So is that what you're recommending? I should get a massive laptop. Well, 
especially because you're not going to be like carrying it around a lot. Like, yeah, um, I have like the 16 inch MacBook Pro, which is like perfect for me. It has like 64 gigs of RAM, um, and it's I've been using Macs for like you know almost 20 years now. So it's uh, and 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 frankly, the I do appreciate the bigger screen now. Like once I hit 40, the my eyes just kind of like. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> just yeah, said, have. This, this just told me they needed a bigger screen. So um, it's working for me now. So 16 inch MacBook. So I, that, I mean, that's pretty similar to what I currently, I am a, I have a 13 inch, but I also have a, my, in grad school, I had a, a, I guess it was a 15 inch, I think. Is that possible? Maybe it was 16. There used to be a 15. Yeah. There used to be a 15. Yeah. So I think I had a 15 and I went down to the 13 because, and actually it was the portability because I wanted to still have like a high powered laptop, but I didn't want to have to carry back and forth because when I was doing my postdoc at Hopkins I was remote so there was some kind of traveling involved and so I wanted to have something smaller but I think I probably would go with something a little bit bigger for this yeah and I have gotten more comfortable like spinning up you know computers in the cloud if I need to do something that's like more memory intensive or more or something or sometimes like I need to do something that's not going to finish by the time I need to like go do something else and so I've become a lot more comfortable doing the cloud kind of computing stuff yeah so that okay but that's the opposite of your you used to have the opposite take didn't you i know yes that's true but i have uh you know i've evolved over time i guess (laughs) this is good to know okay so that's because my main hesitation for still doing a laptop versus like i don't know some crazy like imac pro or something would be that i um I don't, sometimes when I have like sensitive data, which I actually don't currently, I'm not working on any projects that currently have any EHR data, but when I was, you know, it can be kind of cumbersome to figure out how to convince them that I want to be able to run something on like some kind of server. It makes everybody nervous. And then you have to go through like a thousand different things. And, and, and those data sets, you know, they're not like, I was never working with like millions and millions of rows, but it would be like, you know, like 500,000. And you would, if you had like, you know, multiple imputation or something, it could take a little while. So it's a pain for it to be running on your laptop. I don't know. But maybe, I mean, also though, to be honest, every time I've been in that situation, it's always been like, they wanted me to run. I had to VPN into whatever server they had anyways. So <laughs> sort of. A- right. Yeah. Often there's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like if they're nervous enough not to let me put it on like AWS or something, then they're also probably nervous enough not to let me take it off of their server. So right, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I think um, for me, the the main reason to have a desktop is just to have a much larger screen, frankly. Um, and you can do that with like external monitors and whatnot. Um, but I just so. Okay. Okay. Well, this has actually been very helpful because then I can, because external monitors, I mean, even like I could kind of within my budget, I could buy external monitors. Well, I don't know if I'm allowed to have external monitors both at home and at work that come out of my startup, but if I were allowed to, I could, you know, probably do that and just have a single strong laptop that I carry between the two um, rather than like needing two separate workstations completely. Yeah, it is a lot of stuff <laughs> at the end of the day, but um, and I try to like I I, I don't use an external monitor just because like I don't like having that much stuff, um, even though I do anyway. <laughs> but yeah, when I when we were on video a second ago, you had a whole whole setup of stuff. <laughs> hey, now you're not supposed to reveal like the the internal workings of the podcast. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's top secret. How the sausage is made. Oh. Um, Okay. Well, this is very helpful. So I think I'm going to lean towards looking at laptops. I also have been, I've been using Macs since graduate school. So I'm more comfortable, I think, just using, getting a Mac. I like Macs. Um, Does yours have a touch bar? It does. There's no way to avoid it. Yeah. Mine does too right now. I was hoping that like, I haven't been keeping up because I know you keep, I feel like you keep up with Mac like updates. (laughs) Are they ever going to get rid of those? (laughs) I think they they will eventually, but it's just going to take some time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Shall we move on? Yeah. Let's move on to the next thing. The next one is super easy, actually. Is it? Oh, okay. Uh, So your your question was, what's the next big tech thing? Yes. (laughs) The answer is, I don't know. (laughs) No. (laughs) 
<laughs> no, I was hoping you could like, I don't know, opine on this a little bit because I feel like it's fun to get philosophical and you seem to be like, you know, you're like a, like a thought leader. You could come up with this. I sense mocking uh, that's happening right now. No, it's not. No, genuinely it's not. I think this is because, so this question came from, I like consume a lot of media, I guess on like, just like, I don't know, articles and books and stuff on like the advent of different technologies. And it always, every time I do, I'm like, it just feels like, oh man, these people that came up with it, it was, I mean, I know this isn't true, but it feels like it was so easy. Like something comes about and these people are just sort of sitting around thinking about stuff and they're like, oh, like the personal computer would be something that people would be interested in. And it just sort of feels like they flow from one thing to another in such a way that it's like, doesn't it feel like we could guess what the next thing is going to be? And it also always feels like every time it happens, it's like somebody tries it and it doesn't quite work. And then there's some extra like invention or piece that like makes it all come together. And a couple of years later, that's like the brilliant thing that moves on. You know what I mean? I think so. First of all, going back to our discussion about scientific communication, like all those narratives are written like after it all happens, right? Of course. Yes. Yeah, so they like tie a nice, neat thread between them. I know that's, that's a really good point. But it, and they're probably, I mean, they definitely are like a million things that don't work out. But it just feels like, you know, I don't know. I was, well, yeah. let me ask you this. What, what is, why do you want to know the answer to this question? Well, there's two reasons. One, because I don't know, I just think it's like interesting to hear people's thoughts on this. But two, like, what if we started the next startup and we're billionaires, Roger? That could be us. <laughs> now, now you're talking my language. All right. <laughs> <laughs> like, because we think about like, even just the internet, the most recent, I was listening to an audio book a couple of days ago, which actually is what made me put this on there. But it was just like, talking about how, you know, like the internet existed for a long time before it was really maximized in a way that like did anything kind of startup wise. And then of course there was like a bubble that popped and then they kind of had to like restart. But, um, but it's just interesting to think about like, what was it that triggered the internet being something that the general population could access. And also then it became something that was like, that people could make money off of. And, um, and I think, I don't know. I'm, this is definitely just because this book was speculated on this, but I think probably it's right that like being able to have like a GUI interface for a browser was probably the like big kind of tip off where you're not just having to like deal with a terminal and it becomes something interesting. And then of course the next piece was like being able to search. So like kind of the different search engines. And then of course, like social networking was the next one, but all of those sort of built on the fact that this technology that existed for a long time I mean, the technology didn't like update so much, I guess maybe the speed updated, but the real difference was someone thought like, Hey, we can, you know, make this something that people can access in a sort of easier way. And it can have pictures and whatever else. And so I was just like thinking, I mean, anyways, I was thinking about like, sometimes people say the next big thing, I was actually hoping you were going to pick something like statistics related, like AI or like <laughs> predictive modeling or something like, you know, personalized medicine and like trying to speculate, like we have some of the technology for that, but I just don't think it's happening. And like, what is the, like, what's the thing that's missing <laughs> that needs to happen for that to become successful? You know what I mean? Like, what's the equivalent of coming up with like, the GUI so that people can like interact with the browser without having to open a terminal. Like, yeah, what's, yeah. I, you know, so uh, another theme of this podcast is, uh, as, as you know, is Palantir, <laughs> 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 but ignoring the company for a second, um, the idea that we can kind of generalize like data analyses, um, I think is potentially lucrative, right? I don't, I don't think it's possible, but if it were possible, I think it would be lucrative. <laughs> yeah, that probably, like, well, and what is the reason why? So, because right now, when I think about the reason why it's not possible, it feels like it's because there are so many different, like, small decisions that have to take place. But maybe I, we're not thinking about it right. Maybe there's another reason that it's not possible that we could just solve. I think the one reason it's not possible is because we don't have a fully specified model for the process. Like, I think we have a half specified model for the process, yeah. which is like, how do you build a data analytics system, you know, to kind of accomplish some task, right? Right. I think we have, we have theory about that. We have, you know, a lot of tools, you know, um, but I don't think we have a very good like way to talk about what happens when that doesn't work. 
Um, and so, I don't know. I've been thinking about this a little bit very recently, and I think, I think, if we could, so if you look at like machine learning, I think machine learning in many ways tries to close the loop between like fitting a model, seeing that it doesn't work, and then retraining the model to kind of improve it, right? Um, and that's like a closed loop in some sense, right? So the idea that if machine if, if machine learning really worked, um, you wouldn't have to do anything because it would just it trains itself, right? It it looks it fits a model, it sees what's wrong with it, and then it fixes it, right? Which is kind of like what we do in data analysis in some ways, right? Um, but I think everyone, we all know that mach- that's not what happens with machine learning. Like there are always problems that it can't fix on its own. Um, and so there's something there's got to be something bigger here that we can't characterize well, and I think that's part of the problem. But well, the other piece too, because like the machine learning, when I think, I mean, maybe it depends on the like uh, content matter, but the issue with machine learning often is if you truly had like infinite data, and you had infinite data, then you wouldn't have to fit a model. You could just know the truth. But if you had a lot of data, then you can do that iterative, like fit the model and then check it on some other data set. You know, like the you could rely on some of the more um, robotic pieces of it, but often that's not, so that, I mean, that, but that's not totally a fixable sticking point, but that's one of the sticking points in addition, I think. Yeah. I, you know, you came to the wrong person is all I have to say to you. Um, No. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so bad at this kind of question. You know, you understand, like every time I have this conversation with somebody, like I've got nothing. And I think that's why I'm not like going out there starting, you know, starting some startup. Like I think if you would go out there, like start some startup company, you have to have like a pretty strong idea and you have to be committed to it. Right. So because otherwise you'll probably fail. Right. Yeah. But see, this is what's interesting, though, because like even thinking about like, <laughs> so like, oh, well, uh, well, we can deviate from this quickly, but just as a small aside, like Facebook, for example, Like, I'm not convinced that Mark Zuckerberg actually thought that was a good idea. Like, right at the beginning when he was doing it, I mean, he was like, I I think in the first, you know, even maybe the whole first year, definitely the first couple of months, he was like, when he was even already in Silicon Valley, he was like working on this other project to like, basically do, um, I think it was something like upload, being able to like share files, like MP3 files or something that they were going to like add to Facebook, but with the idea that like social networking by itself, wasn't going to be the thing, like they had to have something else. And it was not right. I mean, I think that the right social networking really could have, it was the thing. And obviously he kept on with it, but it's just interesting. Cause like, I don't think he believed it <laughs> and it still worked. So. I don't know. So are you saying I should just spit out a random idea and then we'll just we'll just hope that it works? <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's yeah. I mean and other people obviously like knew that his idea was gonna work because he got people to invest with him and stuff. So yeah. It's just like I and I, there's obviously a huge element of luck. I mean, I think your first point that like all of the media that I consume on this is all retrospective and so it's only, you know, there's a huge survivor bias here. Because- yeah it's only talking about the people who came up with the idea and then it like totally worked but but it always feels like you know because there's some like similar threads like like bill gates and mark zuckerberg both kind of came up with some idea and then started these companies when they were like six years old (laughs) (laughs) you know actually you know i'll I'll give you one i'll give you an idea for free actually actually i'm giving everyone the idea for free right so (laughs) world so this is not the best way to start a billion billion dollar company well no no actually it it doesn't matter because you know people say if you really have a good idea you'll have to jam it down people's throats right so um i do think that there is something to be done about like the whole gig economy thing right Mm -hmm. i don't think the gig economy is like going away like i think there will continue to be uber drivers and whatever right um, but it definitely could stand to be improved, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I think it, there are things that people miss about like working at a company or working at a university for that matter. Um, and there are things that people definitely do not miss. Um, and I think if you think about like what is it that a corporation gives you, right? Um, it essentially smooths across all its employees, right? And so... What if you work for a big corporation and you're sick one day? Well, there's someone else there to kind of like pick up the slack if it's just a day, right? You know, and or if you're like 
Yeah, and there's other kinds of kind of like smoothing that occur within the corporation, whether it's like your health insurance or you know all that kind of stuff. It's not like just down to you. Like if you're just like an independent contractor and you are sick, that then you just don't make money that day. Period. Right. Yeah. So the idea of like having a week a biweekly salary and you know this kind of like regular like you don't actually it's like your, your biweekly salary is not directly tied to like what you did in those two weeks, right? And it's just we just kind of smooth over the year, right? Right. So I think I feel like there's a way there could be a way to kind of replicate that kind of phenomena without having to create like a corporation that people work in. You know, it'll have to be like an employee. Yeah. I mean, health like so like the easiest thing would be something like nationalized health insurance, right? That would be like the most uh, then like it doesn't matter where you work or who you're working for, whether you have health insurance and it's like and you smooth across the entire population of the country. Right. Um, right. But there's other things like that. Like, you know, for example, if you're like a Uber driver and like um, you're not making like a biweekly salary, like, you just make what it, you just eat what you kill. Right. Um, but there may be ways like financial mechanisms to kind of smooth that out so that people can have some level of stability and things like that. Yeah, that's this is very interesting because now I'm like, so I don't know. I, I like, I actually worked when my, um, between my, what year was it? I'm trying to remember. I don't know. One year in, in graduate school for the summer, there was this like Southern something. I can't, oh gosh, I can't even remember the name, but they basically will fund students to work at startups to like, see what it's like to work at a startup. And so this is obviously like just something I'm generally interested in, but I worked, I got funding to work at the startup for a summer. And that's what the summer, the startup, what funded people who it was particularly for um like software development gigs uh, but that was their like uh, that was their bread and butter and they like see maybe i should have stayed working, <laughs> working there <laughs> but they like basically took on the risk because they would hire you as a, like as a contractor but then they would make sure that you like they guarantee that you got work you know at different places and right. then yeah and when i was there they like had kind of talked about, I mean, I know they would sort of like wax poetic about different ideas about the gig economy and how like we could kind of redo how we think about health insurance is actually the big one that they mentioned. And if you could like kind of find ways to help subsidize that, like through a, like through an organization like this, where like basically you work for the, I mean, the thing is like, it starts to be tricky because it's like, well, what's the difference now if you work for this company that gives you health insurance that then like contracts you out to these other people, that's not really a gig. Economy. Yeah. Then you're just like working for that company. Yeah. And there's lots yeah. of companies that do that. Um, yeah. But anyways, it's interesting that you say that. Cause I think that you're probably right. I, I think you're right that that's something that people are going to be interested in because people are going to want more flexibility but I don't know how to solve the problem. Cause I think like, even like thinking about people who are working in kind of roles where, you know, right now they're like, they, they don't always have full control over kind of what um, safety protocols they like are going to be given because they work in a certain, you know, whatever kind of industry and the current status of our world is like a little bit uncertain. And so if you could like, I think having more flexibility and if you have a certain set of skills, you can work for a different industry quickly. Like that kind of gig switching is also appealing to the worker where you don't have to worry about dropping your health insurance right, and yeah. stuff. There, there was a moment there where I thought you were just going to like stop recording and then run off to like go work at a startup. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. No, I like, I just think I find it so fun to think about, but like also, I mean, I think that being, at, in a university setting, it's kind of gives you like, you get to sort of start your own startup in some sense, although you don't get the like same kind of, you know, but there's like elements of it that feel the same where you're like competing for grants. And so you're writing up kind of like, it's like writing up a pitch book, but it's not quite as cute. Cause it's like a 15 page grant with no margin. Right. <laughs> but there's like elements that I could translate to sort of like you're trying to acquire funding and you get to sort of pick what you're working on and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good luck with your startup. Oh, thank you. Well, now I know a computer to get, so <laughs> <laughs> you're well on your way. <laughs> yeah. Well, this was, I, this was great. So you were good at it. You knew it. You did it. I knew you would be good at it. Now, see, now I'm just worried you're going to take my idea and like get rich off of it. <laughs> well, I'll include you. Don't worry. We've got it. We have a record now that that it was your idea. Yeah, you'll you'll find something for me. <laughs> <laughs> they like advisor and unpaid advisor. 
all I demand is that I, I want to be on your website. That's all I care. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. We'll put your headshot right, <laughs> right next to my hair blowing in the wind. Uh, all right. I want to I want to do this game with you. I, we'll, we'll, okay. we'll, we won't do too. We won't go too long with it. Um, but I, I do want to try this. This is this is part game, part experiment. OK. Are you ready? I think so. So the segment, I want to call the segment, How the Heck Did This Happen? <laughs> <laughs> and since it's a family podcast, you know, I got to keep it clean. Um, yeah. But uh, here's the idea. The basic idea is that I present to you like a scenario, okay? A hypothetical scenario, a data analysis scenario. And you have to try to explain to me how it happened. Oh, so like, is it like a data analysis gone wrong? And I'm like, I'm trying to do like a postmortem on it. A little bit, but gone wrong is maybe a bit strong. So you'll okay. see what I mean. I'm just these are very simple scenarios. We'll start we'll start simple. How's that? Okay. What if I'm bad at it? Wait. <laughs> <laughs> well then I won't work for your startup company. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I mean you're just gonna have a headshot on our website. It's not like you're really gonna <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You have a very prominent place in our startup. You can be a co founder for sure. <laughs> um are you ready, Lucy? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. So here's I'm going to describe to you a data analysis like process system. And then I'm going to describe to you an outcome. And you need to explain to me how it happened. You'll, you'll see what I mean in a second, okay? Okay. So I think you'll recognize this first one. So I'm going to... So the first one reads in some data on a variable called X, okay? Okay. Very commonly named variable. Um it then removes the missing values from X, okay, by just removing them, um, and then calculates the mean of X. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Now, I was expecting the mean to be 4, but when I calculated the mean, it turned out to be 10. Oh, yes. How did that happen? There was missingness that was not random. What does that mean? So that I think means that the values that were missing were probably more likely to be small than to be big for some reason. And so, well, first of all, who knows what why your expectation was wrong? You might have just been wrong. <laughs> okay, well, hold on. one at a time, one at a time. <laughs> Let's, all right. So the first one you said was missing values were selectively. Uh, well, what's the word? It's um. There's like a selection process that produces the missing values, right? Right. Second one was that my expectation is incorrect. Yes. Anything else? Well, from the information we've been given, those would be the two kind of main things I would think of. Okay. I guess. Yeah. This is the kind of this is the kind of information I'm trying to extract out of you here. And I guess the one other could be like if you didn't read it incorrectly, but I'm assuming that that part or like calculate the mean correctly. <laughs> but I'm assuming that that's all. Yeah. So the so, let's assume the software works as yeah we would expect. But reading in the data, that's interesting. It's possible that. There could be a problem reading in the data, right? Or like how missing this is coded and stuff, but that's probably, it sounds like you removed all the missing values, so. Right, yeah. Okay, what about outliers? Well, yeah, that's a good question. But see, outliers, I guess this is, I sometimes have a hard time with outliers, like even teaching outliers, because I feel like um, unless it's that the data is wrong, so if the assumption is that the data was collected correctly, which maybe that's a bad assumption, I don't even know if I said that. I should have said that. But the assumption that the data is collected kind of without mistakes would be kind of one thing. And if that data is truly collected a certain way and the mis there aren't quote unquote mistakes, then like I don't really, you know, I, I'm always conflicted when people talk about outliers because it's like if that's a true number and it pulls your out and you decided that the quantity you wanted to calculate was an average, then that truly is the average. You know what I mean? Well, I do no. I totally agree with you. I do find I have that same struggle, um, but you would agree that if there were, uh, let's say, <laughs> it's hard to even ask this question now. But if there were quote unquote outliers, that could produce yeah. a mean of ten when you expected one of four, right? Yes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that is true. I guess the, the yeah. I guess maybe what you're saying is that if the outliers are real, then your your mean your expectation is incorrect. Then was wrong. Yeah, that would be what I am saying, but, or, or that like either that your expectation is wrong or that like the mean really wasn't what you intended to calculate when you were saying that you thought it was an average of four, you really meant you thought like the center of the data was at four or something like that. And Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Good. That's, that's more or less what I got for this one too. Hmm. All right. Number two, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. It's going to get more complicated. 
Oh, dear. So now you're reading in data on X and Y, okay? Two variables. So you read those data in and you pass them to a linear regression like LM, right? Okay. And you regress yep. Y on X. And then from that, you extract the estimate of the slope, okay? Okay. So ignore the intercept for a moment. You ex you're expecting that the slope should be between like two and five. Okay. Uh, but instead, the estimate of the slope is minus four. Okay. How did that happen? No missing data in this one. No missing data. Okay. And like, we could still have, like, were the data collected correctly? And are they actual the truth? So there's like the first question of like, is are these the true values and um, or not? So that would be kind of the first piece. But well, hold on a second. So when you say are the data corrected, collected, ugh, collected correctly? Yeah. What is that? What are the implications of that? I think what I mean is without measurement error, which maybe is like a hard one to, you know, but like if there is, so if, if you're regressing, like if your uh, X variable is age, like did somebody, like, is it possible that the person entering the data put in like 58 when they meant 85? You know what I mean? Like that kind of thing. Okay. But it's tricky though, right? Because not, not all forms of measurement error would reverse the sign of the what you would expect no that's definitely true but it could if you like had consistent like if you were consistently like always kind of doing it in the wrong like if you were always doing it with some kind of confounder in, um, right there would have to be some systematic pattern in the error process yeah for that to show up maybe i should because my first so the first time when you see like sign switching and stuff the first assumption is always that it's like some kind of like confounding or Simpson's paradox kind of situation where you're missing an important variable. Uh, right. Okay. So that would be like, my first thought would be, you know, and, and this is like, sometimes when I'm trying to teach my student, like that relationship between X and Y, if you were trying to say that this is the relationship between like, like it's, it is the true relationship. It just doesn't necessarily mean that it's a causal relationship. Like that's, a correlation that you're seeing well we're not even going down that road right we're not even we're nowhere near that <laughs> oh, at the moment at least <laughs> so that but like if you were trying to fully determine like if you thought that the like cause of relationship between the two would be two or four or whatever and you saw negative something there could be some other factor that you're just not accounting for that would once you adjusted for it would change that sign Th this would kind of fall under the broad category of like your model is wrong Right, your model's wrong. Yeah, yeah, but then there's like a lot of ways your model could be wrong because your model could be specified incorrectly. But like you also, like a linear model might just not be the appropriate tool too. Like you might have, um, well, I guess that's still your model's wrong. But you might have like nonlinearity or something like that. So instead of just having x, you needed to have like x and x squared. Right. There could be. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else? Uh, let me think about what else would make your sign or I don't know the model being wrong feels like the most obvious one. it's funny you say that because I feel like and maybe you could tell me your experience I feel like when people first um do data analysis like when they're at the novice level um that's usually not their first the item on the list you know what I mean what's the first item there's a problem with the data oh I mean, I guess my first thing I said, though, was like, assuming there's no problem with the data. So, well, but, not, OK, yeah, I mean, not that there's a problem with the data. So I guess maybe I should what I should say is that the cause of this deviation has something to do with the data, I guess. Right. And not that you've just misspecified your model. Right. Not that the data are appropriate and then like we're just not capturing something. Yeah. Anyway, that's just been my experience. I don't know about you. Yeah. Well, I feel like I don't, I, I, I feel like I'm still collecting experience on that front because I, but I think you're, I mean, you're probably right on it. I, I, um, I, I'm trying to think about like how my students would address something like that if they saw, cause, cause I also think that sometimes I, it, maybe there's like a U-shaped distribution, like or pe folks who are not super experienced, that would be their first assumption. But then you could also see people who like, um, if, if they have been, no, I guess it's assuming that they think the model is correctly specified. So they already have thought about that. But if they've been like fitting this type of model to this type of data for a long time, and then they see this weird relationship, their first instinct could be that there is something weird with the data. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, it depends a little bit on like the historical context, maybe. Um, I also feel like if students have learned about like model selection, <laughs> then their instinct is then to be like, well, let's change the model. So that's different, right? Because then, then there is something wrong with the model. But, but then the problem is they would never suspect anything about the data, right? Right. Oh, that's exactly because I think that there is some like kind of sweet spot of being skeptical on both sides, because I think that I don't know. It's hard, though, because I don't know how what you do about being skeptical about the data other than like just get different data, <laughs> like get another sample and make sure that or like understand how the data was processed or something. But um, hmm, this okay. is very informative. See, the, the problem is, is that you're doing too well. So <laughs> No, <laughs> you're throwing me off my game here. Um, <laughs> oh dear, I missed outliers, so that was. Well, you had a good explanation, though. Yeah, I can get my way out of. <laughs> so, all right, the last one I've tried to formulate in a useful way, but I'm hoping it lands uh, in kind of your domain of expertise. Okay. Okay. You ready? Yes. Um, it's a little bit more. This one's a little bit more abstract, all right? So, let's say I. Okay, let me see if I can phrase this correctly. Let's say I do a clinical trial. I run a clinical trial, a randomized clinical trial with two treatments, okay? Okay. And, uh, you know, like moderate size, you know, or small. It's 200 people, let's say, right? It's a typical R01, you know, <laughs> that I work with, right? Yeah. Uh, 200 people, 100, 100 people per group. Uh, is like a control group and a treatment group, right? And I do, and I we collect the data, I do the analysis, and there's the effect is zero, Okay. Okay. The difference between the two groups is zero, um, which is an accurate description of every clinical trial I've ever worked on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's good though. That's informative. That means we won't ask that question again. Hopefully. Well, okay. It's a 200 person, tiny little clinical trial. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it again, right? Maybe, That's maybe, true. maybe you know, it's, it's very small. Exciting. So yeah. you think, you think this is an interesting idea um, and want to replicate the study. But okay. you don't you don't have the ability to run like a randomized trial, um, but you do have data on the same variables uh, from like an observational type of study. Okay. So you do you do an observational analysis, and you find that there is a large effect. How do you explain that? I think my so it's kind of the opposite. I think of how you how, like most of the time. I feel like observational studies are done and then a randomized trial is done. So I, I know like I did this on purpose. <laughs> So null results. I'm not sure. Like, I guess I don't know how motivated I'd be to like go seek something out in an observational study because I don't think I'd be convinced by it. Because if I saw, you know, in an in an observational study, I would basically suspect that I was just missing an important confounder um, that was that that I just couldn't quite identify, but that would be driving the effect. Because if it was that, I think that would be my 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 first, like my gut reaction to seeing a really large effect that, and I would probably try to spend a little bit of time, like on the kind of looking at the covariates that I had in my data set, my observational data set, and looking at the covariates in the randomized trial and sort of trying to see, did the two, like across the things that we know about these patients, do, are they kind of coming from the same population? Because with just 200 in the randomized trial, it's definitely possible that you've like, somehow selected a population like the randomized trial could be wrong i mean with 200 it's sure. possible that like it's just not generalizable like it's a specific subset of people and so you could do that but even even if i saw my, that my randomized group and my observational group across covariates that we had collected looked the same and i still saw this like weird difference in the observational group i feel like i would still be suspicious if there was just some other variable out there that we were not collecting that was kind of that we weren't adjusting for that was really driving the effect so I'd probably start trying to like talk to content matter experts about like do we think there's something that could so because if it's a so the other thing is in the observational setting I mean this is what like some of my dissertation stuff was on these tipping point analyses because sometimes I think people just say like oh that's an observational study so it can't be right but it has to be wrong because of something, right? Like the reason you would see a big effect in an observational study that wasn't true would largely be because there's some confounder that's very big that you're missing. And you basically would need to have a confounder essentially uh, in the simplest case, like as large as the effect, as the like spurious effect that you're seeing. And so, you know, I think I would probably investigate, like, is it plausible that there's something out there that big that we're missing? Okay. 
Does that make sense? Is that okay? I think I got like three things there. <laughs> okay, sorry. Maybe I just rambled too long. I'm sorry. No, that was the point. No, that was the point. So we we have like there's like the are you measuring the same thing is a big one, right? Like are the variables in your study the same as the variables in the other one, right? Um, then there's like the population um, that you sample from, right? And then there's the possibility of some unobserved confounder in the observational study. Right. Uh, which I guess would be high on the list, right? <laughs> that would, I mean, that's like my, probably the very first thing I would think of is like, is it plausible that there's some unobserved confounder? And even if it wasn't, like, I think I'd probably first say, is it plausible? And if someone was like, yeah, it's plausible, then we'd stop there. <laughs> and if nobody said, yeah, it's plausible, then I'd move on to looking at kind of like, well, are, is that randomized trial really generalizable? Does it represent the same population that we're looking at in our observational study? And then I think if we checked all those boxes, I'd come back around to like, you're probably just wrong about the unobserved confounder being plausible. Would it be fair to say that there's no methodological solution to this kind of uh, problem, I guess? I mean, yeah, like not that I can, it, not that I can think of, because you can't, I mean, you could basically, the solution methodologically would be you basically would state that like, pretend like we have a, an unobserved confounder this big, and then we'll get the same results as the, um, as a randomized trial. And then maybe you would like, by methodological, do you mean like just from that data that you have not collecting any new data? Yes. Yeah, so not collecting any new data. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I don't, uh, at least off the top of my head, I couldn't think of like how you could sort of rectify the two besides just saying that we must either be missing something this big or the randomized trial must have like had some wackadoo reason why it was. Right, different. yeah. <laughs> All right, well, that's the end of our game and I appreciate you uh, playing along. Wait, but like you didn't give me feedback. Is that what you thought <laughs> I would say? Yeah, no, I, that's the problem. I told that, that the problem is that like I, I mostly came to the same conclusions that you did. So like I oh. didn't. Uh, but so the reason I uh, let me tell you, explain to you why I'm playing this game with you. Yeah. I find that, you know, people who are really good at data analysis um, should be good at this game. Right. <laughs> like oh, when boy. they see when they see something that's unexpected they immediately drill down to like the most likely cause, right? Yeah. And I, and sometimes it's like un, it's sometimes it's like eerie like how they can do that, right? Um but it's not like magical. It's just cuz like they've seen it more times than you have, right? Uh and and so and they've developed a pattern in their head like oh, when you see this kind of deviation, it's 99 times out of 100 because of this thing, right? Because I don't know, there's some error or whatever, right? And um and I think that, uh, and so like, you know, Hillary mentioned this example last time where she, the, she they did this like uh, password field and I think it was at Etsy. Um, and, um, and they decided to show people the password as they typed, thinking that like the error rate and the password would go down. But then when they added that feature, the error rate and the password went up actually. And, and no one could figure out why that was. And it turned out like the, the web browser was using like an autocorrect system. And so there was, it was trying to autocorrect the password. Um, and, uh, and so I think, so that's kind of like, I feel like that's the kind of thing where it's like if you, it's hard to, if you see like an unexpected outcome, like, you know, the rate goes up instead of down, um, like your ability to diagnose that problem is a, largely a function of like your experience and also like your exposure to these kinds of things in general, right? Yeah, it's so you got I you mentioned in the last podcast, I actually updated some of my lessons for this last week with my students based on some of those things you were saying. I know Hillary sort of mentioned that she felt like some of this wasn't it was more like you had to have an apprenticeship. It wasn't really something that could be taught. But I do think that like, for example, I was teaching um, how to look at like uh, residuals versus fits plots, you know, when they like to see if there's like constant variance. For, right. Like, mm -hmm. And, um, and so I decided to like show the students how they can generate data under different circumstances and basically had them generate a whole bunch of data that was like where the, the residuals were normally distributed and generate a whole bunch where you would see kind of some mild, um, like, you know, uh, non-constant variance and then somewhere you'd see some really extreme non-constant variance and somewhere you see like linearity or non-linearity and different, and basically plot those. So they're looking at like 30 different plots that, um, that fit kind of like randomly fit these different circumstances to try to, I mean, 
who knows if this is going to be useful, but I was sort of hoping to emulate like, okay, I've done these analyses a million times and I've seen a whole bunch of them. So I can sort of just look at a graph and say like, oh, that looks like there's some fanning there. I need to like be cautious or like, oh, that looks pretty good. Cause I think it can just all feel great to them. And I like this week, we're doing the same thing with QQ plots to try to like understand, like, let's look at a whole bunch of different, you know, different ways that a QQ plot can look kind of funky to get an idea for it. So I feel like anyways, yeah, I, I I think it's like you, I think, you know, students early on, they don't always, they have to recognize kind of what's the unexpected and yeah. then they have to know what to do in those cases, right? Um, right. And I think I don't, at least in the past when I've taught these kinds of classes, I've never done a very good job of like, of explaining that. Um, and also like, I'd want, I did I kind of try this out on some of the students <laughs> in terms of like, can they explain why they see a certain phenomenon in the data? And I think it really, I think this kind of thing, like you're obviously very good at it because you passed, um, but it really tests your knowledge of like, do you, do you understand how these procedures really work? Um, because um, I think if you don't have a lot of experience with them, like you don't necessarily know that like, um, for example, like for example, the measurement error problem. Like it's easy to say, oh, there's measurement error, but it's not. It's hard to say, like, well, the measurement error has to be configured in this way, right? Yeah. Um, and same with like outliers or something like that. Like it's not like outliers always cause a problem. Like they only cause a problem, if, like depending on what you're looking for, right? And so, um, it's anyway. I, I find it's it's like an interesting way to test people's knowledge of these procedures. Not just like can they apply the procedure to the data, but do they understand like what's going on underneath? Yeah. Hmm. What would you have done if I did really badly? <laughs> <laughs> I had 100% confidence that you would be fine. Oh my gosh, but what if I did bad and then you're, you're like, you were, your plan was to be like, yeah, people that aren't that experienced are really bad at this. And then you just sort of this like awkward silence. Like, yeah. Just drifting off. Yeah. I, we could have <laughs> ended 10 minutes. I would have just cut it and we would have ended 10 minutes earlier. <laughs> You like mention the game at the beginning and then it just doesn't show up in the episode. <laughs> oh, poor Lucy. Well, it's a good thing I cut out the whole, all those parts where you did t horribly. So. <laughs> that's right. Where I fumbled around. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, that's, I've already kept you here for quite some time. Uh, so I don't want to uh, eat, a, eat, well, eat into more of your precious schedule. So Great. Thank you for having me. This was really fun. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us. It was awesome. I feel like I've gotten so much. I know what computer to get and I know what startup to do. <laughs> Just remember me for your website. That's all I say. I'll try. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>